Good morning, all. Hello, Rabbi. I don't think they, can you hear me? No. Hi, sorry about Hi. that. Hi. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> yes, happy Lagbomer. Happy Lagbomer. It's uh it's a funny thing. It's Lagbomer is one of those things that gets people's uh <laughs> it, it gets uh people's uh excitement going, both pro and con. There there is a group of people, stubborn people who uh, are still fighting the emergence of Lagba Omer as a holiday. <laughs> uh, sort of also have a similar feeling about Tubishvat, but Tubishvat has not emerged quite as dramatically as Lagba Omer has, both beautifully and tragically in the last couple of years. Uh, but there are those who uh, just uh, find it annoying. <laughs> That Lagba Omer has emerged organically to become 
uh, such a big deal. Um, I even remember, well, oh no, that was not my phone, that was Tubishvat. But uh, I mean, in India, there was a whole big thing because Tubishvat was becoming massive in, uh, in certain communities of India. And they were, uh, I mean, amongst the Jews. And there were people that felt that, that things needed to be brought back to context. Um, but as we've seen with many other customs, you, when it comes to customs, uh, you cannot manage them <laughs> as much as people try, as much as rabbinic figures even try. You can't always manage customs. They, they develop a life of their own. And Lagba Omer certainly has developed a life of its own. I personally, when I was a yeshiva student, was... Uh, we were told not to go to Mehron. This is already going back to the late 70s. We were told not to go to Mehron at the time because it was Bittal Torah, that uh, you should be learning Torah and going to Mehron is just a waste of time. Um, so for years, um, I thought of it that way and didn't go. And therefore it wasn't very much on my radar. Um, but then when I was teaching at Orsamech, so now we're in the, like the uh, 90s, the late 80s and the 90s. So when I was teaching at Orsamech, uh, my son Shauli was like two and a half uh, when Lagba Omer came by. And so, and I was working uh, part of the staff for this, what they call the introductory program. So the introductory program maybe had like 40 people that were part of it. So we rented a bus and we went to Mehron and part of it was Shauli got his haircut there. So I brought my family with me and we went up and that was the first time I had really been there for, oh no, it wasn't. There was one time when I went in my twenties, I went with a friend of mine in my twenties and we went on our own for the night, just at night, um, for the actual lighting part of it. And then when I went with Orsa Mack, we went during the day. So even when I went with my friend at night, we did not get the whole picture of what was going on. But when we went during the day, it was like absolute. I'd never experienced anything like it. It was there. I mean, at that time, they said there were 150,000 people. When you read the reports now, they say as many as 300,000 people have been, you know, have been going in the, let's say, um, let's say five years ago, there were maybe 300,000 people there. Um, I'd never experienced a pilgrimage before. That was part of it and the power of a pilgrimage. And, but it was such almost chaos. Uh, at the bottom, there was a full-blown market. And by market, I mean, they were selling things like sneakers and t-shirts and I mean, boom boxes. And also there were people who were hawking holy water from Baba Sali and other kinds of people. It was like such craziness. And then when you walked up, because to get to the top of Mehron, Mehron, we would, I think in most places you'd call it a hill. It looks like a mountain because, um, it really does, you know, it stands tall, but I don't know how tall it is. You can walk it. It's not, it's not a hard walk. And, you, and there's a road. Uh, as you're moving up, there, there were tents for political parties. Um, so Likud sponsored a tent and you'd have some singer in that tent and there'd be drinks and, you know, like there would be that kind of stuff going on. And then when you got towards the top, then it was all Hasidic dancing, it was all dancing. But it was crowded and even my kids like ay remembers it as being dangerous and that has nothing to do with the reason that everybody got trampled all those people got terribly terribly tragically got trampled a couple of years ago this was just the dancing the dancing was so pressed together that even like as a kid he remembers just feeling not safe uh, which is terrible <laughs> at an event like that that he should have that remember that memory but it was like dancing around the fire in the beginning uh so when i was in my 20s i saw the lighting of the fire on top there but when i was um but when i went with 
or Sameach, I had that experience. Then I, we returned, and for a couple days later, I, re, I started remarking to people, students that I had taken there, that I really did feel that there, something moved inside of me, that, it, that, it, that I was on some kind of holy pilgrimage. As crazy as that place was, it was like a kind of Woodstock kind of feel to it and like sort of crazy and almost out of control at every step of where it was, plus not holy at the, it didn't feel holy down at the bottom, it didn't feel holy as you're going up. And even the dancing had that element, that weird element to it, but somehow I felt it and I very much wanted to go back the next year and we went back again the next year. And if somebody, if if I had continued, we moved back, but I assume I would have continued going every year because there was something about it. I can't explain it. There was something about it that kind of, I, maybe it's the going on a pilgrimage and being there with so many people that was really moving. And we don't have pilgrimage festivals and we don't have really other pilgrimage sites. Although um, Sippy and I and the kids, um, when we first moved to the States, uh, I had a gig, a Pesach gig for four years at a hotel in Florida. And one time we were picked up at the airport by a guy who asked me if there was some kind of Jewish pilgrimage site because he's noticed so many Jewish people coming. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently I was on a pilgrimage and I didn't know it, but, uh, but it, there is something about it. And I know at, at, at the time there were so many rabbinic figures with great wisdom maligning it and, uh, and saying we shouldn't go to it. And as Yeshiva Bahrain, Hasidim went to it. Hasidim uh, took it very seriously and they went to, anyways, I'm talking about like in Yeshivas, in, in the Yeshiva world. They felt it was Bittal Torah. It was not holy, you know, they, they were really rebuking it, but there was something there. There was something, I don't know how to explain it. And and I get all the Lagba Omer uh, skeptics or whatever you want to call them, the ones who uh, say it's not a holiday and people are making way too much out of it, but there's something there. Well, it, it seems that anything that could bring that excitement to Jewish should be celebrated in a way. <laughs> we get not that much of it, I guess. I, I, yeah. I even feel even Yom Atzma'ut, which again, in the Yeshiva right. world and the yeah. world, they yeah. don't promote it. But I had that feeling about Yom Atzma'ut, but not this. There were, I got that part, the part you're talking about, which, which I do agree about Yom Atzma'ut, that I felt really, but not this. I didn't, although Leslie Silverstein, was at Yom Atzma'ut in Jerusalem, and she davened Myra. There was a there was a, a a gathering for Myra on Yom Atzma'ut, which she said was because it was thousands of people, you know, davening Myra together. And I guess if you did that for Yom Atzma'ut, I guess somebody could feel it, could feel the uh, pilgrimage aspect to it. Maybe. Uh, Rabbi? Yeah. Uh, I know that it, it used to be the custom that people would, you know, they'd have, uh, they do uh, hadlaka. They, they burn valuable possessions. I know that that used to be the custom, you know, years ago, because the Basim Sulfur wrote at length against it. Right, because he said it was, it was Baltashkis destroying. Yeah. Among other things. He had other yeah. problems. Yeah. But is, is it still the custom now for people to do that? It, in Israel, it's weirdly become the custom. And this goes back, hmm. I'm going to say, uh, 40 years, at least 40 years, maybe longer. It's become the custom that the kids prepare the hadlaka. And you, you actually, you have to lock up your things because they, they, they'll take any flammable object nearby, including valuable furniture and other kinds of things. They're not specifically looking for the valuable stuff, but it's become a thing 
And now you see them trying to, they haven't stopped it. They're like, Shauli sent me a video from his, uh, here, I'll show you from his neighborhood. Everything was put up by the kids except for the bleachers. There's bleachers. But this is, I'm gonna, just gonna show you because he sent a video, why not? All right, so I'm gonna share content. Oh wait, I don't know if I can share it. No, it was a, uh, I can't share it. Cause it was, uh, it was a WhatsApp video. How do I do a WhatsApp video? Here, I'm just gonna share it from my phone. That's what I'll do. Um, So this is just the parking lot in front of one building. Oh, wow. Oh. That's just his parking lot. That, that's, his not, building, that's, that's not a major hadlaka anything. This is just a parking lot. Oh my goodness. Now he, so what they did was they, they set up like the area, the bleachers and stuff, the rabbi from his shul, which was a nearby shul, you know, in his neighborhood, there's, there's probably 50 shuls. So one of the rabbis from the shul was in his parking lot. And, uh, but these are all local people. And, and so they set up like some bleachers and then the kids get to create the bonfire so and there's very little supervision there's supervision at the lighting of it but not at the setting up of it and it's just noted that and and was known i remember even when we were living the adults participate could you ask them back do the adults participate david said in the burning once the lighting comes then the adults are there but in the setting up there are almost no adults it, but that's it, before yeah okay yeah. Right, but that's the taking. So if you ask, what are they burning? Right. <laughs> they are often yeah. burning stuff. Like it was just yeah. no that if you don't lock your stuff up and keep it away, that it will get burnt. It'll end up being in these giant bonfires, which um, so yeah. But once the when once it comes to the um, to the lighting to the hadloka then uh, then the adults are all out there. It's also interesting, like for the first, when I, when I was doing it, you know, let's say starting, let's say, uh, what Sippy and I are married, let's say 39 years. So let's say from 39 years ago, when I would go to the local ones, they only knew one song, <laughs> which is- we'll over, and over, over and over again, over and over, yeah. <laughs> Right, so that that limits how long these things can last because you you know how long. Now there's there's a whole world of music that's oh. devoted to it, and so now they can go longer. Even in West Rogers Park, they've they've started doing it as a much more organized official thing with rebbe's involved, like Rabbi Frank Tursky and Rabbi Unger, like the Weitzner Cheder was doing it. So they they have made it much more spiritual and uh, reflective, I think in the last several years, even in West Riders Park. When th that thing, which you saw like in front of Shaulis, that's way more, um, you know, uh, his auristic, way more uh, heartfelt um, than it used to be. It used to be a big fire, and then you'd sing Bar Yochai as many times as you could tolerate, and then everybody go home. All around Israel, there are bonfires because even secular Jews have bonfires. Even kid, a lot of kids. Like I remember, we lived when we first got married in Beit Vagan, and we had this view of the city. We had a great view of the city from our back porch. It was a beautiful view. And you could just see bonfires all over the city and a pall of smoke, like a thick pall of smoke over the city because there were so many bonfires, even like 
the equivalent of Boy Scouts and things like that. Lagba Omer would be a kind of a camping night out uh, for, a, for a lot of them. Rabbi? Yeah. I wonder if maybe people in the, in the International Space Station have seen. Oh, Bob that's good. Cool. Yeah, I wonder. That's a good point. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I wonder. Uh, I wonder. That would be. That would be good. Uh, or, or even just satellite photos, because Israel has satellites, too. I wonder if they haven't. I'm just going to look one second. I'll Rabbi, try. what is the significance of having bonfires on Lagba Omer? So, I'm going to say that the significance has caught up with the event. <laughs> Initially, when when it when it was explained to those of us who are not mystics, it was explained that the fire represents the the light of Torah. Um, so the there is a midrash that says that the it asks the question, um, what is that first light when it says God. Uh, created light on the first day what is that first light because there's not the sun and the moon and the stars until the fourth day so what is that first light so the midrash says that this was a kind of light that you could see from one end of the world to another it was a it was a, a spiritual light and but that light was then hidden uh, because it could be misused by the wicked and therefore it was hidden for the righteous in the world to come that's what it, that's what it says in the midrash so there are mystical teachings hasidic teachings that although that light was hidden you you can access it you can access it through torah so it it and so the deep especially the deepest aspects of torah are often compared to light and and as particularly the light that comes from fire, that the Torah itself is characterized as fire because it provides both warmth and light. So that so the the so a, a bonfire in this case could could be said to represent the fire of Torah, which brings warmth and light. Now, why would you have the fire of Torah specifically on this day? Because the tradition is that this is the day that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passed away. And on the day that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passed away, he revealed, up until then, he taught the secrets of the Torah. But on that day, he just like revealed it all. It's like everything um, uh, emerged. Um, he is identified as, as, the te as the teacher of mysticism, by the Zohar, he, he's the, the great teacher of mysticism. Obviously, he's not the originator of the, of the ideas. He himself was a student of Rabbi Akiva and, uh, and many of you know, the scholars of his time. And so he, he, he is just considered the great teacher of mystical Torah that he received from those who came before. So in a certain point, he, in a certain way, he is like the the uh, doorway of the revelation to the most mystical aspects of Torah. So you could see the appeal to mystics and, and the Hasidic world who are very much um, connected to that kind of Torah, uh, the Torah, the mystical Torah. Um, so, um, so the fact that this is the day that he, he really revealed so much of the Torah, this becomes a an opportunity to uh, to sort of connect to that revelation. There's also there's there's a there's a, a notion uh, that is sort of popularized by Riff Dessler, but it, it was a notion that you know that's been around, which is that that every day has its own kind of energy, and that we travel through those days, we revisit the energy of that of that day. So there's like there's a weekly cycle. So when you're on Sunday, you're revisiting the energy of Sunday. Sunday is the first day of creation. So, in a, so every Sunday you revisit the first day of creation. Uh, 
every Shabbos, you, re you revisit the, the, the energy of Shabbos. In fact, when we revisit the energy of Shabbos, there's Friday night where you revisit the first Shabbos, and there's Shabbos day where you revisit the energy of, my, of, the, of the giving of the Torah, and, uh, and Shabbos like in the afternoon where you, re where you are visiting the energy that is eventually going to be part of Mashiach. Um, and, uh, and so you, it, and when you get to holidays, so when you, when you're experiencing Pesach, you're revisiting the energy of the original going out of Egypt. And when you get to Shavuos, you're revisiting the energy of the giving of the Torah, etc. So, um, so too, when you would get to this day, you would be revisiting the energy of this time, uh, which is Rishim Bayochai's uh, revelation of the of the hidden Torah, which is that hidden light, which is uh, then expressed by the by the uh, bonfire. I'm sure there's, there's thank you, Rebecca. There was something like that. All right. Um, what was I looking? Oh yeah, picture satellite picture. Let's just see if there is such a thing. Satellite. And they just have stock photos, high relative stock photos. What is a delayed lag bomber? Yeah, I don't see any off the bat. That doesn't mean there isn't any, but now they're coming up in the, there. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, but my, uh, as Lois said, uh, it, you have this day where people are gathering in joy. Jewish people are gathering in joy all over the, all over the world. And uh, so that's a beautiful thing. And then, of course, the focus on this aspect of Torah, which is a beautiful thing. And, and also the opportunity, you don't always get to see Rebbe's. Um, a lot of times, the, except for Chabad, the Hasidic world is, is fairly insular. You can... You can access it, but you actually have to go to them in order to get access. And, and for women, it's even harder for men than it is for men. This is one of those moments where they come outside, you know, like the Rebbe's are outside and you get to see a kind of a, a devotional um, moment between the Rebbe's and their communities outside. <laughs> as opposed to inside. You can still, by now with YouTube, you could probably, you can find every Rebbe with their, with their group. And, and it's also funny because uh, we have this, because um, we are very much exposed to Chabad, but we're, we don't get to see a lot of the other Hasidus. So you, 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 you don't imagine that they're very big, you know, that, that there's a lot of people. <laughs> Shauli and I went to see the Ger Rebbe. We got a bracha from the Ger Rebbe on, on the Pesach, on the Cholomoy Pesach. I have a friend who was also my chavrusa. His name is uh, Michael Wyshansky, who's a physician who um, became close. He's not a Ger Chassid. He himself is more in the camp of Smotrich and Ben Gvir. <laughs> but he, um, his medical, he, he's one of the, he's the head of a department at, at uh, Hadassah. And therefore he, tr he ends up treating a lot of Ger Hasidim and has a relationship with the Ger community. So uh, he was going to get a bracha and he, he asked if we wanted to come along. So we went into this building. There were thousands and thousands of Ger, just men, Ger Hasidic men waiting online to get a bracha from the rabbi, it, it, the average, I think, wait time was like four hours. You just went, you didn't get a personal moment. You just, you went in a line 
you didn't even get like a dollar from the rabbi. You didn't even have that. You, you just went in a line and you walked by and like he would nod to you as you walked by. But it was like that, that was a kind of line. But we got to, we had special access because of my friends. So we, we didn't have to wait the four hours. But uh, when you see the size of some of these Hasidic groups, and that's just one of them, there's also bells and satmers, like the biggest one, and Vizhnitz and all these ones. They're just, it's just, uh, they're... So anyways, this is a moment. Lagbomer is one of those moments where you get to see the Rebbe's outside with their communities, which is also so. Uh, Rebbe? Yeah. They, was, was there any cessation of this during the COVID uh, outbreak? There was, and then there was a terrible tragedy at Mayron. Yeah. Uh, that terrible tragedy. Uh, they, they definitely, um, I think I think they did cancel it at least one year. Uh, they, I, I believe they did cancel it at least one year. Have they uh, made any steps towards making it a lot safer because of what happened? I could tell you there's a lot of nervous people. Obviously, it didn't. A tragedy didn't happen because we're already in the day. It's already over in Israel. So uh, the, there was no tragedy. Part of the concern was that the people who are in charge don't give you the impression that they care that much. It's hard to believe that they wouldn't, but they, they, they just don't give the impression that they're taking all the steps that others would want them to take. But apparently they did. I mean, um, certainly nobody. It, 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 I mean, part of the tragedy was that there were people who felt like they had warned about this and nobody listened. And uh, others had already raised concerns. Even my son, <laughs> AY, had raised concerns <laughs> going back 30 something years ago. Uh, people had raised concerns about the safety measures that were up there. Um, so they claimed to have taken steps to change it. I mean, there's people that wanted much more done. And even up to this one, you could see articles and opinion pieces where people were voicing concern, but apparently they did take um, steps that ensured the safety of it, because I haven't uh, heard any, you know, about anything. Now, honestly, around the rest of the country, when I it used to be a matter of concern. These bonfires, some of these bonfires are enormous. And it's not like the, they are following some kind of uh, pr you know, laid out uh, plans for, let's say from the fire department. It's not like there's always nearby fire trucks. It's not, you know, there's not, and they're very large um, bonfires. So I'm sure there are local people that also have concerns about the safety of it. And I imagine that different communities are better than others when it comes to ensuring the safety of it. But let's say my son's, the one in my son's uh, parking lot, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe that there's a nearby fire truck and that they were advising them on how to do it. It's possible, I guess. I saw Arab Pesach when they do when they burn chametz, that the city has started to put out these metal. Um, they almost look like these metal, those moving kind of containers that you'd have, or these large garbage kind of metal kind of containers. Uh, so they put them out for burning chametz. They didn't used to have that, and it was very haphazard. Every Every parking lot had a place to burn your hummets, and those were not supervised. They still aren't I, when I'm there, but at least the city now puts out these. And uh, yeah, but anyways, there's. So with with a, a bonfire that large, um, you have to have something to start it. And if they're not using like kindling or whatever, they're, they probably have to pour an accelerant on it. And that's really. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, yeah, no. So again, I'm sure that I'm sure, that, you know, in, in my experience, um, we had, uh, when it came to the lighting of the bonfire, uh, adults that seemed to have experience and uh, were safety conscious in, my, in the ones I was involved in, but you could definitely see the concern 
especially when you know there's so many bonfires being lit around uh, around the country. But yeah, um, fire is a very powerful thing. Um, my experience it's a it's a it's it's very useful meditatively, and especially amongst Hasidim, you'll you'll see it's more prevalent that they will have some kind of a candle lit or a lamp like a with a fire a lamp lit at every prayer service like uh, it's not as common in ashkenazic circles obviously you have a near tumid in almost, almost every shul but they're not they're not actual candles anymore they're just some kind of a, a lamp or a, a light but it's still very common in hasidic communities when you daven at the Ahmad, you'll see, like even at the place where the Chazan is, you, you'll often see two candles lit, lit candles. There is something powerfully meditative about a flame. And, uh, and um, I remember there was a, a rabbi, Mordechai Delinsky, of blessed memory, who used to give this Friday night class uh, right before Shabbos started. He would give it as a kind of class as you're entering Shabbos. And for a while he would turn off the lights and he just had these, these, these little kerosene lamps. And it just, the atmosphere was very powerful. So that it is you, the, the use of fire as a, as a kind of meditative device, as a kind of access of the spiritual, you, you can see the allure and the power of it. Uh, if it's done, if it's done well, and there are many places where, where it is done well, and it could be. Yes, I remember on a Hanukkah, we were invited to Rabbi Unger, and he meditated on the candles for a half hour. <laughs> the Hasidic Rebbe's, it's a, it's a thing amongst Hasidim, and that is on YouTube, you have a lot of them, where has, it's almost every Hasidus, you gather when he's lighting the candles. In some of them, you actually, he, he makes the wicks. You, you see the whole process, like he'll make the wicks made it meditatively, he'll pour the oil meditatively, he'll light it. And, and you see, even like, sometimes you see like bells or some of these places where you see thousands of Hasidim in, in their bleach, you know, on their bleachers, all watching him as he's, uh, as he's preparing it. Yeah, Hanukkah, uh, it's, it's a particular, when, even when I was a buffer, we would go around sometimes to watch the Rebbe's light their, uh, their Hanukkah candles. It's sort of interesting that we don't have more, I guess it's better that way because it's safer that way. Um, but it's sort of interesting that we don't have more of it. Hanukkah certainly is um, about that, you know, focusing on the light. And there are people who, who will suggest even in our private Hanukkah uh, lighting that we take time to just uh, sit with the candles lit for a while quietly and um, just focus on the light. But it is sort of interesting that we don't have more with it because it is such a powerful meditative device. Rabbi, I just want to tell you something related, but not yeah. that. Um, yeah. Yesterday, Rabbi Moshe Wolf uh, gave yeah. a class here and he wanted yeah. to talk about Log of Omer. And what he decided to do was see an AI thing that wrote about Lagba Omer. And I was so happy because it just didn't capture anything. <laughs> it doesn't know the soul. Yes, it doesn't know that's the soul. right. It doesn't know what. Except, <laughs> except that I saw, I did see, there's a Chabad guy somewhere yeah. who, who offered a kosher AI. You know, the, the, as a response to uh, the square, remember last week I was mentioning to you that square forbade any association with AI? Yes. <laughs> so he, he, uh, I think he's just a, I don't think he represents an official Chabad body. I think he's just, he happens to be a, a Chabad guy. But he, I don't know how he did this, but he has um, a kosher AI. So apparently the problem that they were addressing was heresy. You know, if you ask the AI, um, you know, a question, you get a heretical response. So his one, you know, doesn't, you know, somehow, I don't know how it's able to do this, but it always, you know, it gives a, uh, what we considered a, a, 
an acceptable Jewish response to any of those kind of questions. And it sort of stays away from stuff that would be heresy. So he might have shown that it that you could already do one that starts to give deeper response. Oh. That I don't, that's like to me, that's two steps and they're gonna get there. Because it, it was it was always a question of the internet too. If you that's if true. you Google on the internet, you're gonna get whatever. And now when you Google, you get real good stuff. Not always, but a lot of times you get really good stuff. So that <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't assume that's gonna remain a problem. This guy may have already solved it. I don't, oh, wow. I don't know what his name is, but he somehow already seems to have done something about that. Okay. Be well, guys. Happy Lag Bomer. Thank you, Rabbi. Tomorrow, well. God willing. Bye, yes. all. Bye. 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 Bye.